that way we can uh, wrap up uh, wrap up fairly quickly. Um, I'm going to go over uh, you know agronomic management and and kind of how we can help improve uh, productivity. Um, very similar similar to Lynn, I, I talked to Brent and we we kind of went through a course of action of what we wanted to talk about. Uh, the unfortunate thing is you could probably do a whole university semester talking about these three subjects. So we're going to go very, uh, you know, gloss over these things uh, somewhat quickly, kind of get everything going, um, kind of take a different approach to some of these. Um, I, I see a lot of familiar names on the participants list. So, uh, you know, probably probably know a good way to get a hold of me if you have any questions or, or you know, definitely would uh, would would love to field any questions any of you might have. Um, first, we're going to talk about crop rotation, why we crop, why we rotate. Uh, some very basic concepts, but um, there's no reason why these basic concepts can't be the sole driving force of why you select uh, various crops into a crop production system. I'll say it again, probably some sometime at some point today, but but price is is never. Or, or should never be within a, a crop rotation management scheme. Uh, that's a that's a good way to kind of get yourself going into more a uh, monocrop or a monoculture production system is because usually there's a, a set amount of time to where price of one particular crop outweighs the other ones for multiple years at a time. Does that mean that we need to put all our acres in it? No, no but it's, it's a good reason to go heavily on one side or the other, but we should always stick to our rotations because the value is long term. Um, kind of talk about why, what we do and, and why it works and um, kind of what, what potential alternatives we could have. Then we'll kind of go into some tillage, uh, tillage uh, explanation. We'll talk about advantages and because we talk about conservation tillage, conventional tillage as kind of anti of each other, we'll talk about advantages of both and it'll kind of spur the discussion of disadvantages of the other. Kind of see how that affects management practices and our management decision. And then we'll kind of help bring it all together. Uh, these are these are these can be very distinct topics, but if we kind of help bring it all together, it kind of makes things uh, feel a little bit better. In Oklahoma, we we pretty much talk about small grains and cereals as our primary crop. That's that's our crop of choice. Our growers they know how to grow it. They know how to make it profitable. I say sometimes because I think at 275 wheat, there's not a way to make it profitable at, at most times, but especially with the cattle market in, in pretty pretty good demand, um, you know, we can make some of our small grains and our cereals uh, somewhat, somewhat profitable. So we get, we get asked the question all the time is, why would I change? I know how to grow wheat, I know how to make it work, and I know how to make it profitable. And it kind of goes back to something I said earlier is that what we're doing is we're providing input now inputs now to, to get a little bit of payback later. And that's why we have that, that consistency of crop rotation within our system. When we look at benefits to the system, one of the biggest and largest uh, benefits is, is crop rotation is IPM. Uh, Lynn talked a little bit about managing your weeds within a system. It's, it's a lot easier to manage your weeds when you're rotating crops as if you're, you're having one crop grown uh, year in and year out. And then in small uh, acreage production or vegetable production, it might not be as uh, might not be as big of an issue. But in, in large scale agriculture, unfortunately, we become very set on a crop and, and kind of go with it. Um, so when we when we do grow that crop over and over in a more consistent basis, what we have is our yield and profit margins get get ultimately larger. Is that uh, we need high input to just maintain yield. Uh, and that's where we're at in our wheat systems right now. We keep on putting more and more inputs, more nitrogen goes into it, more technologies going into it, more uh, genetics are going into it, but our yields haven't haven't increased. Um, and there on the opposite side of the corn, if we go into a low input system, what we're going to typically do is see a yield decline. So there's no winning on that. You're putting more money into it to get the same yields you did 10 years ago. And to kind of emphasize this point, we look we look at historic wheat yields is that from the 1800s to the 19, 1950s, without any big technological advance, we maintained about a half ton per, per acre of, of uh, wheat grain in the state of Oklahoma. When we brought in semi-dwarf varieties, we had improved fertilization through through increased purity of our, our fertilization or fertilizers that we used. We did increase. We we went up to about a ton per acre, so that's you know 100% fold increase, and, and 
and that happened, you know, kind of right in those those 1950s, 1980s, kind of that back end in the 1970s. However, since the 1980s, what we've seen in the, the Southern Great Plains or the Great Plains in general is we've seen only about a six pound uh, per year increase in our wheat yield. And the, the, the benefit to Oklahoma does not look as bright because ever since the 1980s, we've actually been decreasing our average yield by about a pound a year. So uh, even though we've got better genetics, uh, Dr. Carver here in, in at Oklahoma State, as well as a lot of the private industry, you know, getting getting better better technological advances, we're still as a as a state decreasing our, our pounds per year. Uh, and so the question becomes is, is realistically, how do we improve this? How do we break out of this cycle? Well, the, the biggest thing is is to just rotate. Adding crop diversity has, has been shown to drastically increase crop yields. So what we have is figures over here to the right hand side. This is uh, one of the first uh, one of the first projects we did about integrating canola into our typical wheat wheat systems. So the the field they actually conducted this study on had been a ten year uh, continuous wheat system. When you added canola into the system, as far as our wheat yields that year after canola, what we saw is about a ten to twenty percent increase in our wheat yields. Now remember, since 1980s, everything we've done has been decreasing our wheat yields, but we add crop rotation in. And we're seeing a 10 to 20 percent increase in our wheat yields if you're a cattle guy you're working with a lot of cattle growers the question becomes well that's fine i don't care about wheat yields i make my money on forage crop rotation does the same we see that uh, around 20 to 25 percent increase in our forage yields from our wheat production system in that dual purpose wheat um, when we actually do uh, get into a, a crop rotation and not only does this help as far as a uh, increase in in our just yields that way our growers can go to the coffee shop kind of brag a little bit about they have better yields but increased net profits we've actually seen that even if you have a canola crop that fails to where you bring no economic income into your farming system during a a single calendar year um, you actually as a five-year total of your system have actually been able to increase net profits and so just adding in those those crop rotations have been able to drastically increase you know farm budgets and, and farm stability farm security um, so the question becomes is this just in Oklahoma or just in wheat and, and if you look across the US the most successful crop production systems are are consistently rotated in the Midwest we talk about corn and soybean I mean it, it's never just a corn state never just a soybean state it's it's corn and soybean states and we see those uh, pretty consistently rotated on a year in year out basis on the southeast, uh, a lot of sugarcane rice production down in that part of the world. You're looking at uh, uh, both of those being rotated with soybeans and, and usually are quite successful. Southern U.S., we're talking here in the Southern Great Plains, wheat and soybean are, are a very common one. Wheat cotton is becoming a, a bigger thing. And then when we talk about Northern Great Plains, we bring in things like lentils, peas, uh, dry edible beans, and, and various other crops like that, and our cereals. Uh, they grow a lot more oats and rye up there as opposed to us that, that predominantly grow wheat. But the same general concept is we're seeing increasing in yields and, and increased stability of that system. So the question becomes, does anybody see a trend here? I, I see a trend, and, and it's one thing that's, that's pretty consistently about all your, your crop rotations is the yield benefits that we're getting are, are basic rotational concepts. It's getting that monocot, which are our grasses, and a dicot, which are broadleaves, and integrating those into a system together. And what it does is it actually just brings diversity. I mean, we've talked about diversity in a, in a pretty wide sense in the last five years with NRCS and cover crops and bringing cover crops into production system. We talk about diversity and management. And that's fine, but we can do that same exact thing by just rotating our crops around. Because allowing that to happen allows us to break our cycles. Lynn talked a lot about this and breaking our cycles, and whether it be disease, insect, or weed cycles, uh, allowing for rotation of management. Uh, maybe you can do something like, uh, you know, corn or milo in a no-till production system where something you grow like canola needs to be in a, in a more conventional tilled system. So you can rotate your management practices around. Also spreads, spreads your risk, uh, especially if you're doing monocot dicot. Most of the dicots we grow in the state are in an oil market, an oil seed market. So we're talking about soybean, canola, sesame, various things like that. 
where our milo and our corn as well as our wheat are based on a grain type market. So, you know, one usually is, is far superior to the other. So if you have a good, strong crop rotation where part of your uh, farm or part of your grower's farm is in one and not the other, then, then what you have is, is it doesn't matter what the, the, what the farm market system does. You're consistently having something on on those on those acres that are actually going to help you, and it also spreads your labor. This is uh, consistent. We 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 don't plant any of our crop rotations at the same time. You know, most of the time we we plant them in succession. So, you know, we get corn in in, in April, and we get soybeans in in uh, kind of early May. Cotton goes in late May. You can get double crop soybeans. Uh, wheat harvest comes out in May. So so you can see that that it's a more consistent. Uh, more consistent worth of labor where you can work with uh, fewer heads of labor and have them more consistent uh, throughout the year instead of having a high demand for labor and machinery at certain critical points in the time. The other thing that a lot of people forget is is underground. We, we always forget about the underground system when we talk about our crops and our differences in rooting profiles is ultimately what brings a lot of the benefits to the system. Something that has a taproot like uh, soybean, grain sorghum, cotton, canola can can add a lot of benefits by going down deep, getting nutrients, getting water stores from deep, uh, deep, uh, deep soil layers, as opposed to having um, having wheat that's that's constantly wheat or corn that's constantly in the top 24 inches. And that's where the primary bit of their roots are. So having something to be able to go get nutrients, uh, redeposit them on the soil surface for the successive crop next year, that'll be a fibrous root system that'll have a lot of their nutrients primarily on that soil surface and a lot of their roots are right there, kind of work out well together. So the question becomes like, what crops do we want to do? So we'll, we'll forego wheat because wheat is the predominant crop we have in our system. So what, what things could we rotate wheat with? Well, we, we have what, what I call or will call here in this presentation, the old reliable systems. These are things that we know work in the state of Oklahoma. And, and so I have to highlight the point that, that adding crop diversity does not, does not mean you have to go out and get a new crop, you know, a new specialty crop or something that nobody's ever grown before. It's just maybe, maybe putting something into your system that actually is different than what you've been doing. Uh, grain sorghum is, is probably one of our most reliant systems. If we want to talk about crops that are able to stand Oklahoma weather and Oklahoma conditions, farming conditions the most, we probably highlight two, and that's wheat and, and, and grain sorghum. Because when you look at crop failure, it's, it's very minimal. Uh, I, I think if you go back and look at the data from RMA out of 75 years that they've been collecting data on wheat, we've had a complete crop failure in a single year as a statewide a, a single time once even throughout those drought years in early 2000 teens we still were able to pull off a semi uh, semi decent uh, grain sorghum crop um, it's it's also one of the lowest cost options for typical return on investment you know seed is cheap uh, we need a little bit of fertilizer uh, in in season management is cheap risk is cheap labor is cheap so so we have a low cost option with with typically we'll we'll be able to harvest a crop that that can get you a, a pretty good return on investment uh, the increased opportunities that we have for grazing uh, sorghum stocks are stocks are becoming uh, more evident we're starting to see very good opportunities uh, a lot of the risks that we thought originally uh, we had in the system of prussic acid and nitrate or nitrate toxicity we're, we're not seeing those come come true come through if you manage that sorghum crop effectively and efficiently and we're, we're able to let our, our cattle go out on those stalks and be able to um, take advantage of some of that added nutrients and, and forage during the, the summer or during the winter months it, the the downfalls of the system is it's it's still a grass and we're in a grass-based system so uh, some of the the benefits of, of crop rotation being able to target some of your grassy weeds and, and use herbicides effectively are limited uh, you still can have um, a, quite a few pests uh, that that transition from uh, wheat into grain sorghum pretty effectively one of these that you can highlight is something we had an issue with this year was chinch bugs uh, we get chinch bugs all the time on wheat um, they effectively can go to grain sorghum without seed treatment. So um, if, if you have something like soybeans that, that are not as affected by chinch bugs, that can be an issue you, you don't have to overcome. But if you go into sorghum because it's a grass going into a grass, that's something you do, you will have to overcome. 
And once again, if you've worked with any growers growing growing sorghum, one of the biggest complaints is there's limited herbicide options, specifically for grassy weeds. We're a very Johnson grass state. We have a ton of Johnson grass compared to most states in the United States. And so one of the biggest grasses are, are one of the hardest things to control in sorghum. But the only thing about this is you just have to be a little more proactive. You have to be more proactive in going out, getting those herbicides, managing them effectively, and, and be able to uh, go forward in your season. So when we talk about another old reliable, and this one is highlighted as a soybean, but if you look at the general basis of this, soybean and corn are effectively the same. So these, these effectively can be talking about the same unit. The profit potential of both corn and soybean are extremely high. Uh, we have some growers this year that are that are telling stories of, of over $400, uh, $400 per acre net return on their soybeans. Um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable how good our yields are coming off this year. Um, and, and so it's got great potential. It's also a great rotation with all of our small grains and our cereals. It fits well into a summer crop rotation, very flexible within our system because we can do that double crop system. Actually, one of the best ways that we can integrate soybeans into our, our production system is, is to grow it right after wheat, as long as there's moisture. Uh, the only issue with this, as far as soybean and corn, is, is risk is high. Um, you know, a, a stretch of 90 days of over 100 degrees um, with very little rain and um, all that kind of will add up against soybean. We just won't be able to come or overcome that uh, too often. Uh, and so it, it is a, a potential high risk, high reward crop, um, but, but realistically there, there are ways to overcome it. You just, uh, that management has to be a very, very on, uh, on spot and on prime uh, to be able to do uh, soybeans effectively, especially when you get west of I-35. The last one of our old reliables is, is one that probably uh, m many people saw in places that they haven't seen in at least a decade, if not closer to two, three or four decades and that's cotton. Uh, there's a, an extreme increase in interest in the crop um, and especially with our new 2,4-D dicamba options on the cotton crop, uh, the interest is growing substantially. There's very decent yield potential. Uh, we can have a lot of guys that are getting multiple bale cotton this year, um, but you know a, a pretty modest bale and a half cotton with current prices can, can get you pretty good um, a uh, pretty good return on your investment with a, a, a lot of increasing infrastructure. We're having a lot of mills or a lot of gins go in um, in places that they're seeing high priority for the future as far as a cotton crop. The downfall of having a lot of weed control options is the fact that there's a reason why there's a lot of weed control options is there's a lot of weeds that you have to deal with in cotton. And as you see the picture here, um, dealing with things like mares tail and pigweed and cotton is is a mainstay. You're, you're going to have to happen and it's it's something you have to do and it's one that cotton until it laps rows and and uh, you know covers up and shades up that bare ground it does not compete well with with our weeds so it's something that has to be done um, the other thing is is in the drought even in our cotton areas that are down in the water district that that a lot of guys were pumping a lot of water to it we failed to cut a crop for about four years we didn't get a single bale of cotton out of the state of oklahoma so um, you know, that, that is an issue. It's, it's not highly resilient. It's not as resilient as something like grain sorghum, um, but it's not as high risk, high reward as something like soybeans or corn. So it's kind of middle of the road. The biggest thing to do or the biggest downfall is, is small acre farmers. Uh, you either have to buy in or, or not with cotton. Um, you're talking about the infrastructure is, is, is needed. Um, there's a lot of specialty equipment. You're talking about high clearance sprayers. Uh, harvesting equipment is different. So if you have to go everything custom, it can be very cost ineffective. Uh, the other thing is, is that you, all, all cotton producers have to enroll in the boll weevil eradication project. So a grower can't just go, I, I'm going to try 50 acres of cotton and see how I like it. That's there, that's just not a very cost effective or, or fruitful measure. It's it's one of those you have to really buy into it and do a couple hundred acres to make it worth your while. But it is an option and it's one that, uh, especially as educators, I expect you guys to see a lot more uh, in the future. I, I expect uh, we saw about a 55% increase in acres this year. I expect about another 50% increase in acres for, for, the, for the next year. So when we look at some of our new faces, uh, many of you might have... Uh, you know familiarity with some of these, uh, but some of you might not. Uh, one of the new players or new kids on the block is Sesame. 
if you've ever talked to growers that have sesame, they either absolutely love the crop or they hate the crop. And um, one of the reasons why they love the crop is the market is right now is outstanding. Uh, the, the Chinese demand for sesame is more than we can possibly produce in one year. And so the demand is going to be high. Uh, we just have to kind of get into the market in the right uh, in the right time. There's great yield potential. We see break even points at about 500 pounds of seed per acre. And most growers can adequately grow anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, uh, given the right soil, the right the right conditions to happen and all that. But 500 pounds as a, a break even point for our sesame crop is actually one that that is e more easily obtained than not. Uh, however, when you look at the disadvantages, the herbicide outlook is very grim. Uh, there's there's pretty much nothing um, uh, as far as broadleaf control. And since this is grown in more of our, our western portions that we're having more of an issue with pigweed, uh, mare's tail, um, some of our cockleburrs, uh, you know, tie vines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, kochia is starting to get a, into a big, there, there's really no in-season control for any of those uh, those really bad weeds when we get into sesame production. It can very effectively control grasses, but but that's about it. And one of the big things is we, we currently have a stopgap as far as knowledge on how to manage the crop in Oklahoma. Um, we don't effectively know all the intricacies like we do something like, a, you know, sorghum or wheat or, or cotton. We don't know all the little uh, ins and outs of this this production system, so it's something that can actually be quite challenging for a lot of growers. So that that is a downfall. The other thing is is even though the market is really good, you're working with uh, basically one company, and so that's that's something you do have to uh, overcome as well. One that we're seeing a lot of interest in is our summer edible beans, and and summer and winter winter we'll we'll just go ahead and throw everything in our summer winter edible uh, beans and peas. It's a growing market. Uh, a lot of these these markets are, are growing through uh, farm to table. And uh, this this movement that we we thought might be just a flash in the pan doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Um, and and it's not only the fresh market. Uh, you know, we have a very good outlet as far as Del Monte over in uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. So it's, it's a place that we can get uh, drop off to that is not in the fresh market that can be adequately uh, grown and, and utilized by our producers. Um, and, and we have pretty good outlets for it. Oklahoma City and Tulsa are becoming more urbanized and, and that farm to market movement is, is growing in all of those. And we are we are about as close as uh, to Dallas Fort Worth area. A lot of our growers as the the coastal bend down in Corpus Christi, Houston area of Texas. So as far as freight getting getting these uh, this stuff down to a, a larger market in Dallas Fort Worth area is about as cost effective as as the adequate places they can produce these in Texas. So it is one that is growing. Um, the the other benefit is that it's it's something that's a broadleaf that's that's a lot more tolerant to some of our stress conditions. Uh, Lynn showed a really good picture and it's a really telltale sign is that it, it essentially, I tell growers that might become interested in it, especially when you talk about like cow peas or mung beans, is it's it's uh, soybeans that are tougher. And and realistically, that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, the the one downfall that we have is, once again, we have stop gap. We don't know effectively, my apologies, we don't effectively know how to manage them. Um, there is also contract and selling issues. Uh, we have had growers have some complaints about contract and selling those with the fresh market as well as the, the other canning operations. So it's something that you have to get over. It is, uh, especially going into the fresh market, uh, quality is judged pretty strictly and it needs to be very, very good quality product uh, to go into that fresh market. Uh, it's not like soybeans that'll go mostly as feed. This is going mostly for human consumption. So um, getting good quality product is a lot more a lot more critical than, than it is in something like we have like in soybean. So when we talk about crop rotation, remember this is just the beginning. This is just kind of scratching the surface. Um, and, and there are other aspects of crop rotation that we we can really talk about in great detail and, and know that management changes everything. And this kind of transitions into the next section we'll talk about is, is a little bit into tillage and, and see kind of how these things interconnect. And um, I always tell growers that there are a lot of choices with tillage and there's no right and wrong answer. Um, people that think that that tilling is a, is a bad option or no till it just doesn't work in Oklahoma. It's just it's very narrow mindset because both of them have a place and they both can work. Um, but you just have to know how to work with the advantages and disadvantages of both systems. And sometimes one will fit 
and the other one won't, or sometimes both will fit into the same system, and that's a kind of grower's dream is that they can choose kind of what fits into their, their farm management plan. But uh, what helps you decide what tillage system you're going to go into is, is kind of your, what's your residue stability? Um, are you wanting to have that residue out there for a long amount of time? Do you have really, really stable residue that can help protect and, and ensure good production systems? What is your erosion potential of your, your piece of property? Do you have compaction issues? What about pest management? Do you have something, are you going weed on weed on wheat that, that could have some very detrimental pest management issues? And then what's your internal drainage situation? Are you a very flooded system? Are, are you feeling like you're not getting good drainage because you're tilling? These are all things that kind of go into that decision mechanism. So if we look at tillage, it just in general, once again, we're not going to go to advantages, disadvantages. We'll just talk about advantages because most of the time the advantages of one is the disadvantage of the other. And so the question becomes, why do we till? Realistically, it's to prepare the seed bed for, and it's, it's needed for some crops. When we talk about things like canola, um, can we grow canola no-till? Absolutely. Is it more, or is it easier to grow it conventional? Absolutely. So it's, it's one of those things that once again, those both fit, but one fits just a little bit better, but getting that nice smooth soil surface to get that crop planted into, into a nice, nice clean system is, is one that is a really good advantage for, for our, our conventional tilled system. The uh, other things is, is it helps us remove problem areas of the field. And it's one thing that, that we don't see as often in Oklahoma, but when we do, it actually can get really detrimental, especially when it's like, I, I need to get my weed out. I, I just have to get my weed out, but it's raining all of May and all of 1st of June. And this year specifically, we saw a lot of ruts in the field that growers had to go out of a longer till, no till to actually get into a tillage system to where they can actually... Uh, Take care of some of those ruts and those those problem areas of the field. The other uh, big thing is to incorporate residue. If you do have something like Goss's wilt is a disease in corn, but it also um, something like gray leaf spot or or any of those those spore bearing diseases, sometimes you just have to incorporate incorporate that residue to kind of maintain that system disease free or or uh, insect free for the coming years. But also if we need to incorporate chemistries, fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, any of those options, you know, varying degree of tillage is, is kind of the best way to do it. Uh, in Oklahoma, it's not advantageous to kind of wait for a rain. So the best thing to do is, is kind of utilize that tillage effectively and, and use it uh, when, when you really need to. And also pest management. Lynn talked a lot about weed management. Uh, some, some, you know, a, a phrase that we like to use is that nothing becomes resistant to steel. And uh, for the most part, without the exception of Johnson grass, bindweed, and Bermuda grass, I mean, for the, for the most part, that's true. I mean, it is one of the most effective way that we can overcome some of our weed management issues. The big thing is it's costly. Uh, there is wear and tear on the machinery. Uh, diesel is cheap, but when when commodity prices are down, diesel that is really cheap becomes not as cheap. Um, but there's also wear and tear on machinery. There's a labor cost associated with it. There's there's travel time over your field, and that's one thing growers oftentimes don't take into account is how 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 much is their time worth, and and that's something that's very difficult to to kind of formulate into a dollars and cents uh, kind of mindset. But it's one that we we need to be doing. So when we go to the opposite side is our no-till systems. Um, so what are some of our advantages? Uh, erosion control is, needs to be the number one priority. Um, we, talk, we talk about erosion control, and, and if you've ever driven around northwest, north central Oklahoma, especially if that's one of your counties up there, sometimes in the fall and the spring when the wind blows, we're donating about a ton of soil to Kansas. Um, it just happens. In Oklahoma, the wind erosion potential is very high, and so tilling it and making it that, that ground into, into very fine powder really is, is um, antagonistic about uh, where most people's farm goals are, so, so kind of introducing that, that no-till system is better. It's also fewer trips across the field, less diesel, less need for labor. All those things can really add up. Um, moisture retention is, is another big thing. Um, and, and, it, and is soil health. I'll kind of group those two together. I won't kind of go into soil health in, in too much detail. I think most people have heard enough about soil health in the last couple of years, but, but saving moisture and retaining moisture into our production systems is, is invaluable. Um, you know, what, what a couple of inches of soil can do in, in a summer crop going into, you know, the heat of the summer, uh, as opposed to tilling it and not having those couple of inches of, of moisture can be very, um, 
very cost beneficial. It also can, can make our systems have a lot more resilience. The more organic matter you get in, the more moisture you retain, everything adds up to where when we have those bad years, sometimes in no-till, they're just not as bad. And so it's it's something that, that really can, can help us out in our production system if we integrate these no-till type systems. The one disadvantage I will talk about, it's the same thing I talked about in conventional till, is it's costly. Um, oftentimes, there, there are additions you have to make on planters to make no-till more effective. Um, you have to invest more into sprayers. You have to invest more in, in herbicides and chemistries. And the biggest thing is that growers have to understand is you have to both plant earlier and you have to plant later. In our summer crops, uh, you have to plant these later because it takes longer for that soil to cool or to warm up in the spring because of that residue, kind of like what Lynn talked about on those mulches. Same thing in our no-till system is that it's, it's got higher moisture, uh, it doesn't get that direct radiation from the sunlight, so it takes a lot longer to, to warm up. But it's also one of the first ones that, that really can cool down because it just doesn't go with those temperature fluctuations in the fall. Once it starts to cool down on average, we don't get really warm soil temperatures again. It just, it kind of starts to cool down and it just keeps on that general trend of, of continuing to cool down uh, throughout the year. So it's one thing we have to t we have to look at it. And our conventional and our our no-till systems are are kind of on two opposite ends of the spectrum. So the question becomes: Is there an in-between, and 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 something that incorporates beneficial aspects of both? And the answer to that is strip till. And and we can't do strip till for everything. This is more of our summer row crops that we can go on wider inch spacing. But what you do is you have a narrow strip to where you can do seed bed preparation, get those really good seed to soil contact, really nice seed bed preparation, minimizing in row weeds. And but it allows you to have those strips of residue in between to where you can actually get good moisture retention, good shading out of weeds in those those rows and and build, start to build your organic matter up by quite a bit. So kind of takes the advantages of both and the disadvantage or advantages of both while minimizing some of the disadvantages. So the question becomes is more importantly, does it impact yield? Oh, my graph is gone. Um, realistically, we, we have a graph here that, that in our canola production system, uh, what we've seen is that uh, compared to a conventional tilled system, our, our strip tilled system yielded about the same and actually out yielded the no-till systems by, uh, by about 30%. So we can uh, have that no-till and all the benefits with no-till without actually uh, being full no-till and we can get those, those uh, better yields associated with it. So when we talk about is, is bringing it all together, this is probably a fraction of what needs to be fully discussed on these topics, but you know, it's, it's kind of what we had in the time that we had available to us. When we start integrating new crops into the system, it doesn't necessarily have to be new crops to Oklahoma. We can look at the crops that have been proven in Oklahoma that we know we have good management opportunities for, like our sorghum and our cotton, our corn, soybean. Um, but what we're doing is we're just adding diversity to the system, getting those agronomic benefits of, of good weed control, good IPM management, uh, organic matter, as well as getting those farm benefits of spreading risk and sp uh, spreading uh, labor out uh, to kind of really help everything uh, come it all together. I do get asked a lot of times about crop rotation and cover crops. Do cover crops provide the benefit that crop rotation does? Well, sure. I mean, if it's a deep-rooted cover crop and you have a wheat system, that does provide uh, the benefits. But kind of like how Lynn touched on earlier, that's essentially a foul field. I mean, you get very little economic benefit unless you do graze that system, but you get you get smaller economic benefit than what it, you would if you're pulling the grain off. The problem, I think, comes into pest management. And there was a, there was a um, publication that came out of the University of Nebraska just uh, about three weeks ago that proved that under cover crop systems, we actually had increased soil seed bank uh, of some of our weeds, particularly uh, pigweed, uh, water hemp, and mare's tail. And so those are our big baddies when we talk about a lot of our production system, because if it doesn't completely stop it, if you've ever worked with pigweed, you've ever worked with mare's tail, no amount of shading is going to stop those things from growing. So they're always going to grow, and you're not going to spray your cover crops until the end of the year. So it becomes like a catch-22 uh, a catch 22 on on doing those cover crops because you just you don't typically manage them you don't get that economic benefit and if you're only working on weed control sometimes that can be antagonistic of what your actual end goal is um, when we talk about crop rotation and no-till production system management does increase greatly you you have to be more on top of your management systems your decision making your variety selection um, because these decisions just become more critical and you become heavily reliant on either pesticides 
uh, mainly when you're talking about herbicide management, because if you don't have steel, you're going to rely on chemistries almost exclusively, or more our high intensive management systems, like Lynn talked about, is mulching, uh, plastic wrapping, et cetera, et cetera, in our smaller, uh, more specialty crops. And really, a lot of this just depends on the scale. This can be very cost effective in both large scale and small scale. The, the little intricacies of the system just, just end up being a little bit different. So with that kind of a little over, not too bad. Not bad for an extension guy, uh, being just four minutes over. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have. If not, you guys can write down in any of my contact information, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you had in the future. Thank you, Josh. Um, if you do have questions, you can enter them into the chat box in the lower right-hand corner for him, and he can answer them. And we, as always, we appreciate your fees, feedback on these webinars, and so please help us by filling out a short webinar. And I'm going to paste a link into the chat box if you would fill that out. Um, tell us how we're doing and everything. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. I want to remind you that our next webinar will be on November 14th and will include a panel of speakers discussing what's realistic on 50 acres of crops. Until then, goodbye. To remind you that our next webinar will be on November 14th and will include a panel of speakers discussing what's realistic on 50 acres of crops. Until then, goodbye.